Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. This is one of over 700 programs that the Commonwealth Club has done uh, live streaming from the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco since the pandemic began about two years ago. And um, we are uh, today going to talk about uh, a history, but a very specific history, the history of wiretapping in the United States. Um, This is a book by Brian Hoffman, and his uh, book is called The Listeners. And we, uh, first of all, it's very informative about how long our privacy has been invaded. <laughs> so welcome to the Commonwealth Club, Brian, and thank you for, uh, for spending the time on the book. And by the way, just from a personal point of view, when did you conceive of this project and, and how long did you, did you work on it? Because it, there's a lot of detail and it must have been, you know, didn't do it in two weeks, that's for sure. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> thanks, thanks so much, uh, George, uh, for having me. Uh, and thanks to the Commonwealth Club for um, uh, hosting and for engaging with my work. I'm really excited to um, uh, engage in this conversation. Um, I've been working on this book for the better part of the last eight years. Uh, I have a seven and a half year old daughter and the Mm -hmm. book actually is older than she is, at Uh least at its conception. (laughs) Um, I first came to the project uh, almost by accident. Um, I stumbled upon an item in a 19th century newspaper involving a rogue stockbroker who had a very elaborate wiretapping scheme up and running in Placerville, California, not too far from where you are in San Francisco, Mm -hmm. um, in which uh, he, his name was D.C. Williams, he sometimes went by other names as well, had uh, found a way to tap into corporate telegraph communications and intercept what he overheard. Uh, um, And in intercepting it, he sent it to a group of kind of paying stockbrokers and subscribers scattered around the country. And they made inside trades essentially based Mm -hmm. on the intercepted information. Um, He ended up going uh, to jail, uh, finally, uh, Williams did, uh, after uh, a couple of months doing this sort of lucrative business of wiretapping. Um, uh, And he was prosecuted under uh, California law, uh, the first uh, uh, wiretapping law passed in the United States in the year 1862. And Mm -hmm. uh, the year in which D.C. Williams, this uh, rogue stockbroker, wiretapper, uh, went to prison was 1864. And I was astonished. Mm -hmm. I, myself, as a student of American history, had no idea that wiretapping, this resolutely contemporary problem that um, at the time was kind of newly urgent in the age of Edward Snowden's NSA, Mm -hmm. um, actually is as old as the wires themselves. And I have been chasing that story, the story of wiretapping, uh, the story of the wiretap and the wiretappers, uh, Mm -hmm. the listeners, uh, from the 1860s to the very near present uh, for the last eight years or so. Mm-hmm. Here we are today. Well, that's, you know, it, it gives a lot of depth to it. I mean, when I was reading your book, I was thinking, you know, everybody's talking about hackers at the high end of the computer industry, and they're, they're getting in here. And then there's a whole other group of hackers. And if, and if the industry finds one of the hackers, they hire them, you know, to, to help them stop the other hackers. And so it's a back and forth with encryption in it. And, and that process is just a more elaborate process of what happened ever since the telegraph uh, was invented, you're saying. Basically, telegraphs invented and, and set up just a year or two before this guy is arrested. Uh, so one of the first things that's done uh, is that it's tapped in order to find information that can be used to, to, for insider information, in this case, on the stock market. You know, very interesting. Yeah, electronic surveillance is... Um, uh, constitutive, I say, to Mm -hmm. our communications ecology. And in fact, uh, you know, concerns about the security of electronic networks like the telegraph system even predate um, uh, um, uh, D.C. Williams in 1864 and Mm -hmm. even predate California in 1862. Uh, Samuel Morris, the inventor of the telegraph himself, uh, was concerned about 
the operational security of telegraph messages in the mm. original design for telegraph system. And he, in fact, um, in his early attempts, uh, his early experiments with the uh, uh, telegraph device, he was burying his telegraph lines underground so that no one could essentially tap them. Mm. Uh, what he hadn't considered, Morse, uh, was that uh, uh, kind of the basic principles of electrical insulation. So mm -hmm. the telegraph didn't work when it was buried underground and he had mm. to basically string the lines overhead. Um, mm -hmm. And we are in many ways living the same world that Morse made and dealing with the very same problems that he himself wrestled with in the earliest conception of electronic networks um, all the way back in the late 1830s. And, and he, he, one of the first ways that they did it, you said in your book, that he devised ways to encrypt the information. And it's not the Morse code, that, you know, that's not the encryption, but that you encrypt the information that you send and that way people can't figure out what's going on. Um, although they can, because they do figure out how to break those codes. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes, that's another part of the process. But in any case, so that whole process has been going on. So why don't we take a step forward? It was very interesting that this guy, D.C. Williams, was arrested in 62 or so, something like that. And you said that, but uh, there was a lot of uh, wiretapping going on during the Civil War, that both sides used that to not only listen to what the other people were saying, but to send fake news uh, back and forth to mislead people. So why don't you tell the Civil War part of the story. So the Civil War story is, of course, roughly contemporaneous to mm -hmm. the D.C. Williams story. Uh, California passes its law in 1862, which is, of course, you know, one year into the war. Mm -hmm. um, the Civil War, the U.S. Civil War, is the first war uh, in which electronic communications prove uh, central to uh, the kind of procession of the conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, historians have, uh, have uh, been interested for decades in the role of the telegraph and of the Civil War Signal Service in the outcome of the war between the states. Um, as soon as military telegraph lines are up and running, um, military signal operators on both sides of the conflict are beginning to tap those lines using small portable devices, portable uh, um, wiretap devices known as pocket sounders. Um, it turns out that uh, the Confederacy had uh, far greater facility with wiretapping than did the Union. Mm -hmm. um, that's mostly because the Union itself had a far more robust communications network in play. So there was mm -hmm. a lot more, there were many more wires to tap in short. Mm -hmm. And word of the ingenuity of the Civil War wiretappers uh, becomes very quickly the stuff of legend. Um, after the war, uh, the wiretappers uh, on both sides of the conflict, interestingly, are, um, are kind of uh, celebrated as heroes for their ingenuity, for their daring uh, on the battlefield. And word of their ingenuity, in fact, travels across the Atlantic and... Um, uh, in the United Kingdom, you can find uh, kind of extraordinary accounts of Civil War wiretapping uh, as late as uh, the late 1860s. Um, mm -hmm. In those days, uh, the, the British referred to wiretapping as wire milking and uh. <laughs> uh, wiretappers uh, somewhat improbably as milkmen. Yeah, and probably the wiretappers are all happy that that nickname changed. Yeah, <laughs> you're right about that. <laughs> Um, so that's the, the genesis of this and with telegrams. So then there's an invention, uh, you know, the, the, the telephone comes along, right? And, and that changes things. I, I, it was interesting how each piece of technology shifts, shifts the argument a little bit. So the late 19th century, we're, we're talking about the telephone and I guess the first thing that people wanted, well, first of all, it was used by very few people um, when it first got started. Yes. Um, and as you say, uh, something that came up later, there wasn't a lot of expectation of privacy um, in the early things. So why don't you talk about how that issue was not even on the table, um, but that's not really what people were focused on at all. So as soon as telegraph lines are, are up and running in the United States, uh, wiretappers are tapping them. And as soon as telephone lines 
begin to reach a kind of sat saturation point in urban spaces, cities like New York, Chicago, Washington, DC, uh, lines are getting tapped, uh, both by law enforcement and by uh, private uh, operators. Um, there isn't much concern, however, uh, at least at first, on the part of ordinary telephone users about the threat of eavesdroppers. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is mostly because, as you say, as you indicate, and I talk about this at length in the book, um, the expectation of privacy isn't necessarily in place. Uh, and that has to do with the unique operational features of the early telephone system. Uh, telephone lines were arranged uh, on uh, at first on party lines. Uh, mm -hmm. So, of course, famously, party lines, uh, you know, you can pick up the phone and listen to your neighbor talk. So eavesdropping is sort of built in to that aspect of the apparatus. And even more commonly, even as party lines begin to fall away, and actually they persist in, uh, in some rural jurisdictions in the United States all the way into the 1980s, even mm -hmm. as party lines begin to fall away in the early 1900s and 1910s, um, it still was the case that eavesdropping was kind of operationally central to the workings of the telephone system. Uh, whenever an operator made a connection, the expectation on the part of AT&T or other regional providers was that the operator, of course a woman, would listen for 10, 15, 20 seconds to ensure a stable connection. Mm -hmm. Operators were trained at the time in the art of what they called civil listening. Um, so you were supposed to hear the kind of quality, the auditory quality of the conversation, but not necessarily pay attention to the content of the conversation itself. But of course, operators, yeah, sure were, that listening <laughs> operators were listening in. <laughs> and this was seen as just the kind of necessary evil of the mm -hmm. convenience of telephonic communication. Um, and it's not really until much later on, until the late 1920s, that privacy becomes a, a kind of watchword, both mm -hmm. inside of the telephone industry and also in the American public writ large. Well, if you know that the, you know someone's going to be listening, one of your neighbors is on the party line listening to or, pro or could be. You're, you're not going to say the same things that you would, you know, otherwise. That, that's, sure. Then that's always been true. Whenever things got more private, people used them more privately. And as soon as they became less private, they didn't, you know, I mean, that's, that's part of the trend of what's going on. Um, and, a, and a fascinating up and down. So what were, what were the first big standouts, uh, you know, cases uh, around the turn of the century? We're going back to the turn of the 20th century. There were some things that really really, you know, were covered um, as, as influencing it. Um, one, of the, one of the characters that you early talked about was William Burns. Yes. So Williams, William Burns, uh, the detective who carried a dictograph instead of handcuffs, right. as he was known, was uh, the most famous private investigator in the United States in the early decades of the 20th century. He was a veteran of the US Secret Service, which uh, in those days was not um, charged with protecting politicians, um, but instead charged with investigating um, interstate crime, usually uh, commerce uh, crime, uh, wire fraud, so forth. Uh, Burns was the star of the Secret Service and went on to uh, become uh, a kind of celebrity private investigator. He opened his own uh, firm, the William Burns Agency, in 1908, I believe, 1907, mm -hmm. 1908. And very quickly, in order to publicize his scientific modes of detection, he adopts wiretapping methods and also other forms of electronic eavesdropping methods as well. He liked to use dictographs uh, to catch people in the act. Uh, How um, did the dictograph right? work? So the dictograph is, is basically a small listening device, a recording device. Um, dictographs usually couldn't record um, on their own, mm -hmm. um, but they would amplify sound from one area to another. And usually on the other side of a dictograph device was a stenographer who would write down everything that was said. Right. Burns, there, there, and, there, weren't, there weren't electronic recorders at the time. 
There were, but not in wide use uh, and certainly not small enough and uh, reliable enough to use in the field of criminal detection, mm -hmm. uh, criminal investigation. So in the in the van, as if a TV show today, in the van where the information is coming in, you'd have a stenographer and not who would just yeah. be writing it all down in shorthand. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So the automatic recorder doesn't really come into play until the 1950s or so, mm -hmm. even though automatic recording, of course, well predates even Burns right. uh, himself. So Burns and Burns was known for for being good at this. Now, how, how what set him apart? You, you talk about his cleverness, at both technological and methodological, about how he went about capturing the information. Well, Burns was good because, to a certain extent, because he said he was good, <laughs> um, and it, it's it, the uh, his uses of the uh, of wiretapping and electronic uh, eavesdropping equipment in this period are kind of inseparable from his efforts to kind of advertise the, the kind of cutting edge nature of his investigative practice. Um, he liked to kind of tout that he was using these new methods of uh, uh, criminal investigation, uh, even if at times they weren't necessarily effective or certainly even legal in some jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is an important uh, kind of lesson. Burns is one of the first, I think, uh, to kind of show it, uh, is that oftentimes uh, law enforcement entities, authorities use these methods, new methods of electronic eavesdropping, electronic surveillance in order to kind of uh, publicize their efforts, to make them seem more efficient, more effective, mm -hmm. when at times uh, there are other ways of conducting investigations that are um, uh, less unethical, say, mm -hmm. um, less illegal in some mm -hmm. cases, uh, and, and certainly more effective, too. Uh, interesting that, that you talk about wiretapping at the time was considered a dirty business. Like, like this, is, this is just something we ought not to be doing um, as a society or whatever, that a lot of people, that's what they felt about it. Um, it's also interesting that one of its greatest uses was was in in divorce cases <laughs> yes which, which which probably is what made other everybody sort of accustomed to the idea and not considered so dirty because it was too crucial <laughs> possibly so the phrase dirty business wiretapping gets branded a dirty business in one of the dissenting opinions to a landmark fourth amendment case handed down in uh by the supreme court in 1928 olmstead v united states justice holmes mm -hmm. Uh, uh, excoriates wiretapping as a dirty business and claimed that agents of the state should not uh, uh, be caught using uh, uh, such a kind of unethical tactic. Um, wiretapping in those days was not unethical because it was a violation of privacy. It was mm -hmm. instead uh, uh, unethical, it was dirty because it was associated with the criminal element. And this is an important mm -hmm. finding uh, uh, from my book, um, mm -hmm. and a, a kind of important storyline in, in pretty much the first two thirds of it. Mm -hmm. um, for the first several decades of the history of wiretapping in the United States, the individuals, the entities that are conducting electronic surveillance efforts aren't agents of the law, but in mm -hmm. fact, criminals, con men. Mm -hmm. um, I've uncovered sort of amazing cases from the 19th century of um, electronic criminals who were interested, like D.C. William was, in mm -hmm. kind of uh, rigging the stock market to their benefit. Um, also, uh, uh, wiretapping was really, really common in the late 19th century in attempts to defraud uh, horse racing pool rooms. Mm -hmm. As soon as racing results are transmitted via telegraph, it means that uh, it's really easy to get the results before the, the, betting, how, the betting parlor does. Mm -hmm. um, and this was a, a kind of form of crime that was uh, pervasive, uh, not especially common, but constantly talked about uh, mm -hmm. in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. There were kind of outsized fears about this new criminal class that had the electronic wherewithal to defraud uh, 
um, the nation, the working of the nation's economy, uh, um, uh, dependent as they were in those days, uh, as they are now, on electronic information. Mm -hmm. um, this really cements a kind of association, a kind of cultural and political association between wiretapping and crime, between wiretapping and a kind of unethical, kind of dirty uh, 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 element. And it takes quite some time, it turns out, for Americans to come around to the idea that it should be the law enforcers rather than the law breakers mm -hmm. who get to use the tactic. You, you, one of the interesting points you make is that, is that you know, when you talk about how um, wiretapping was used to try to break up the mob, was that, that the organized crime used wiretapping of the police phones first. Yes. <laughs> before... Before the police turned it around and started going back at it. And, and you have is, a phrase in there to catch a crook, act like a crook. No, like, this, is another, this is another example of the same kind of association between wiretapping mm -hmm. and criminal activity. Uh, although law enforcement agencies in jurisdictions like New York begin tapping telephone lines uh, as early as 1895, it's not really until the age of prohibition that it becomes a more common and more pervasive investigative tactic. Um, mm. But even then, um, law enforcement is sort of doing the dirty business that the criminals were already doing. Mm -hmm. um, the Olmstead case emerged out of uh, uh, an attempt on the part of the Seattle Prohibition Bureau in Washington to take down the, one of the largest uh, bootleggers in the country. His name was Roy Olmstead. Olmstead, like many uh, electronic uh, or like many uh, bootleggers, used relied on the telephone to facilitate his operations. So obviously, tapping his phones was a kind of easy, if illegal, by Washington state law at the mm -hmm. time, uh, way of bringing him down. But at the same time, even before the Prohibition Bureau, Bureau gets wise to tap the bootleggers' telephones, the bootleggers themselves are monitoring. It turns out as I've discovered, uh, law enforcement telephones themselves, because it turns out as well that law enforcement is using the telephone just as much as the bootlegger. Um, yeah. So there's a kind of interesting back and forth between this criminal element um, exploiting the nation, uh, kind of vulnerabilities in the nation's communications infrastructure and law enforcement entities uh, and also private entities kind of working to catch up. Uh, you're, I mentioned the thing about hackers being hired. Uh, part of the William Burns story that I found interesting was that uh, in 1916, he's, he's in this case and he's made himself famous already and he gets even more famous. But in the end, uh, he's hired to, to run uh, the uh, U.S. Bureau of Investigation, which is the earlier name for the FBI, as you point out. So, so he was like a hacker brought in to... to, to run the investigation of all the crooks. And he, so he must, have been, he must have been in charge just a little bit before uh, J. Edgar Hoover got the job, right? Yes, and what's interesting, uh, given Hoover's uh, well-earned reputation for mm -hmm. dirty and illegal tactics, particularly surrounding uh, techniques uh, of electronic surveillance, uh, Hoover was brought in in 1924 to kind of clean up William Burns's messes, his... Mm -hmm. uh, his dirty acts. The ACLU believed that the Bureau investigation had essentially become lawless under Bureau's, uh, under uh, Burns's, excuse me, um, uh, uh, oversight. Uh, mm -hmm. And that had to do with, uh, in many cases, the uh, fast and loose way that Burns played with the law mm -hmm. uh, and using his uh, legion of private investigators for his own uh, um, uh, the Bureau's own public purposes, and also uh, uh, the Bureau investigations, early uses of electronic surveillance as well. The first time uh, J. Edgar Hoover, uh, ironically enough, goes on record about the issue of wiretapping and electronic surveillance, it's to denounce it as an unethical mm -hmm. practice. This mm -hmm. is in the late 1920s. Uh, and he basically claimed in those days uh, when Hoover was a little more straight-laced, that the Bureau would not indulge in such behavior. Uh, we now know, of course, uh, a very different story. It's fascinating. I mean, that's one of the great things about, you know, detailed, accurately done history is that you get a completely different viewpoint on something 
to think of J. Edgar Hoover as the white knight coming in to rescue the, uh, the, the FBI's reputation is pretty far-fetched to anybody from my age, uh, you know, group. Really, quite, quite, because uh, uh, when we were young, he was still in charge, and that, that's not how he was seen at all. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not, no. <laughs> um, so, so uh, Burns tried, you know, to, to, to use his techniques in favor of the U.S. government taking down criminals. People are still thinking that this is a criminal way to deal with things and we shouldn't do it. Um, but, of course, facts on the ground almost always change what people think. And there's, you have a great thing from the 60s, but we'll get to that later. Um, so in the 20s, um, there's, you know, the, the result of, of, of the boom and all that kind of stuff. But then there's the Depression. And, and there's also the whole prohibition issues. So why don't we talk a little bit about prohibition? Because, as you said, it was used a lot for that. But that was a big experiment that eventually everyone said that really wasn't worth it. And it seemed to have both corrupted the police and the criminals just to deliver alcohol, which is going to be delivered anyway, you know, no matter what you do, more or less. Mm -hmm. so, so why don't you talk a little bit about that? How did the did your history of the wiretapping portion of it play into that big picture? So prohibition is controversial from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the great experiments, uh, the great failed experiments of federal government governance uh, in our nation's history. Um, and wiretapping is an important part of it. I mentioned earlier that it's um, really in the age of the prohibition that the wiretap becomes a, a kind of investigative tool on the part of law enforcement. Um, but it very quickly, particularly after the Olmstead decision in 1928, in which a 5-4 uh, court uh, narrowly decides that wiretapping is uh, constitutionally permissible. Mm. Um, the wiretap very quickly becomes a kind of symbol of the evils of law enforcement in the age of prohibition and the excesses of the nation's war on alcohol. Um, you really start to see this in the late 1920s and into the 1930s, uh, um, an important document in uh, uh, this moment that's kind of inseparable from the Olmstead case is the so-called Wickersham Commission report. Uh, this mm -hmm. is a government uh, uh, commission formed uh, to kind of investigate law enforcement uh, um, uh, among other aspects of the prohibition experiment. And I believe it's the 11th volume or the 12th volume of the, of the report is about illegal police tactics. Mm -hmm. uh, wiretapping was among several um, uh, uh, common, uh, it's probably the most extreme, uh, but uh, um, uh, and least common, but uh, a form of police uh, uh, abuse that was uh, kind of noted uh, in uh, the, the committee's work. Among others are uses of what was known as the third degree, which is sort of like torture methods mm -hmm. to interrogate suspects, um, uh, uh, warrantless arrests, uh, entrapment, uh, and other forms of overbearing uh, and at times illegal police behavior. Prohibition uh, uh, created a kind of breeding ground, uh, the committee found for this type of work and the wiretap was an important part of that story. Mm -hmm. um, I think this leads to the question of whether wiretapping was effective in the age of prohibition. And it mm -hmm. was, at least according to the government. We don't have great statistics prior to prohibition as to how many lines the Prohibition Bureau, uh, among other agencies, were tapping in the service of the war on alcohol. Uh, and also, as I note in the book, the statistics that we have on the record after um, Olmstead uh, in 1928 are somewhat reliable. Mm -hmm. um, but regardless, the party line, at least on the part of a pro-prohibition faction in Congress, the so-called dry uh, faction, was that this was an effective way to 
bring down bootlegging syndicates. And in fact, uh, Olmsted was uh, the great case in point. It was the largest mm -hmm. case in the history of prohibition. They indicted more than 90 uh, suspects. Um, mm -hmm. All that said, the experiment was still a failed experiment. So the question right. of whether it's worth it, I think uh, we know that it wasn't. And so this, I think, is the first instance of a rule of kind of history that I, I tend uh, as a kind of refrain in, in, in my book that mm -hmm. while wiretapping electronic surveillance help kind of bolster uh, the profile of a crime war while wiretapping electronic surveillance sometimes even make um, investigating crime, uh, particularly uh, uh, crimes like bootlegging or drug dealing uh, more mm -hmm. effective, uh, it doesn't make the war on crime winnable uh, right. or even worth fighting at all. Um, I'd like to remind our uh, live stream audience that if you have any questions for Brian, you can send them in on the chat and we'll ask them. Um, so one of the things I found interesting was that uh, the prohibition was, was um, eliminated after the Democrats won the election, right, in 1932. And so I was wondering if, if the Republicans were, you, you, you called them, if you were in favor of, of um, well, Olmsted, Olmsted was, uh, the Wets liked Olmsted and the Dries didn't, or was it the other way around, right? West, right. Um, the and, and, and the Dries so liked dry. Olmsted. Was that really a, was that really a Republican <laughs> Democrat split to be wet or dry or not? Uh, yes and no. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it really, I mean, you kind of have to look a, on a little more granular level um, mm -hmm. than kind of national politics, even though it was, of course, a federal experiment. Um, but generally speaking, the dries were for electronic surveillance, for the government's ability to use techniques like wiretapping in the investigation of cases. And the wets, who were against prohibition, uh, mm -hmm. were against wiretapping. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you said something really interesting about FDRs or wrote about something really interesting about FDR and the Justice Department and everybody used that he had a secret uh, approval of using wiretaps when they were illegal in the 30s. Um, and this wasn't any more about uh, prohibition, but it was for other crime. Um, and, uh, and when they began to think about making it legal, that they all gave their affidavits that it would be a great idea and it would be very helpful and so on and so forth, as if it didn't exist when, it, when they knew it existed the whole time. And uh, that's a, uh, just shows politics doesn't change much, but it's still a very interesting viewpoint. Again, gives you a different viewpoint on, on the president and his, his uh, leading cabinet members um, than we try to remember them by. <laughs> So what you're referring to here, uh, this is a really interesting case that I, I, I track in the book in across the book's third and fourth chapters. Um, Olmsted ignites a firestorm, um, both about uses of wiretapping and also about the excesses of prohibition. And in 1934, Congress passes what's known as the Federal Communications Act, section 605 of which makes it illegal to mm -hmm. intercept and divulge communications by wire. Um, from a certain perspective, from the Supreme Court's perspective in the late 1930s, in two landmark cases, Nardone v. United States of 1937 and Nardone v. United States of 1939. Uh, confusingly, these are two cases uh, 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 kind of retried and reappealed uh, about the same person, Frank Nardone, who was himself a bootlegger after mm -hmm. Prohibition. Um, the court rules that it is in fact illegal to intercept and divulge communications by wire. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of backdoor, backroom hand wringing on the part of the authorities over what the court means by whether it's illegal or is it illegal to intercept and divulge communications. Um, and the word that's really important there is the word and. Is it illegal yeah. if you intercept communications and then don't divulge them? Um, is the illegal act just the interception or the divulgence? And do you have to both intercept and divulge 
Or you're um, not illegal. Yeah. Or you're not illegal. These are like the great semantics of legal history. This is why you go uh, to Roosevelt, law school. <laughs> yeah, this is why you go to law school. Um, or you become an English to understand the word and, you know. <laughs> right. Um, so Roosevelt, as soon as the 1939 Nardone decision is handed down, kind of steps mm-hmm. in and he sends a notorious memo in 1940 to his attorney general that basically says the court, it's kind of overstepped its bounds. I don't think they actually mean that all wiretapping is illegal. And certainly, (laughs) certainly they don't want to get in the way of prosecuting cases, investigations that have to do with the national defense. Mm -hmm. And this became known as the Roosevelt Doctrine and the FBI, among other government agencies seized on it in the 1940s and the 1950s. Um, the same FBI running by J. Edgar Hoover, who was yes. against it before, right? Basically, the idea was that, one, it was legal to intercept communications, to tap a telephone, as long as you don't divulge the intelligence you've gleaned from that wiretap in a court of law. And also, it's entirely legal if the attorney general approves you to tap a telephone, plant a listening device, if it's done in the service of a national security investigation. Mm -hmm. This then opens the door to a kind of black record of abuse on the part of the FBI and other agencies. And it all has to do with this one memo that Roosevelt writes in 1940. And one of the first tests of it uh, is a case I hadn't heard about. I, I thought that was just fascinating. Uh, Judith Copeland, one of the one of the early spies, and you li- listed her with you know Rosenberg and so on and so forth. But but at least I hadn't heard of her, um, and it's because she wasn't found. Uh, she was let off in a way because of the technicalities. Um, but she also was guilty. I mean, it was very clear that she had done this. So why don't you tell her story? Because you know we we need to we need to rescue her from from uh, obscurity. So she's not as obscure as I think you're making it out. I mean, she's certainly not as famous as Ethel Rosenberg, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, uh, or Klaus Fuchs, uh, um, their uh, collaborator. But Judith Copeland, uh, I, this is I've learned that's how her name is pronounced, uh, was um, one of the uh, um, notorious uh, uh, kind of cases of early communist espionage in the United States. Copeland, a uh, graduate of Barnard College, uh, was uh, a kind of mid-level government employee. She worked uh, in the Justice Department in Washington, and um, she had access to the FBI's uh, kind of counterintelligence uh, briefings, uh, mm-hmm. basically what the FBI was doing to uh, kind of root out communism. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's recruited Copeland is to the Soviet cause sometime, we think, in 1947, 1948, and for the better part of a couple of years, is actively feeding information to the Russians Mm -hmm. uh, about the FBI's counterintelligence activities. Um, She's found out uh, as a result of a super top secret government program uh, uh, um, that I don't necessarily cover in the book called Venona, which is a a decryption program. And very quickly, uh, the FBI- Decrypting decrypting information they're getting from the Soviet Union that gave them- Yes, on on, uh, uh, international telegraph cables. Mm -hmm. Um, Very quickly, because they can't prosecute Copeland on the basis of Venona information, because it would then- disclose in a court of law the existence of this top secret army intelligence program, Mm -hmm. Um, they get the FBI on her tail and they wiretapped not only her home phone, her office telephone, uh, they bugged her office, they um, uh, eventually uh, tapped her um, parents' telephone, her parents lived in New York and Brooklyn, uh, and a number of telephones of her friends and acquaintances, all told they're about... What's that? And her lawyer eventually. And her lawyer, yeah. Um, and uh, all told, about 96 federal agents are involved in trying to kind of uh, 
nail down this one woman who they already knew was guilty. Mm -hmm. She's eventually arrested without a warrant uh, um, in 1949. Uh, and a series of incredibly high profile trials ensue in which the FBI's misdeeds eventually come to light. Mm -hmm. um, Copeland ends up for reasons that I detail in the book. It's not really worth going into. She no, ends up yeah. getting off on appeal, even though she's guilty. It's a technicality, um, but it, it worked. It is a technicality. Um, and this ignites a firestorm over FBI surveillance, electronic surveillance, warrantless surveillance, and the province of American national security power. Um, and politicians, both on the right and the left, who were interested in uh, legalizing wiretapping, uh, which was then of still of dubious legality, um, if they were interested in legalizing wiretapping, they kind of attempted to capitalize on the outrage surrounding her botched conviction. Mm -hmm. um, so she becomes, Copeland does, uh, an interesting kind of bellwether for different ideas about um, the limits of national security power and uh, the dirtiness, so to speak, of the dirty business of wiretapping mm -hmm. uh, in the early uh, decades of the Cold War. She's a really fascinating case. Uh, and and uh, as with a lot of parts of your history, uh, the reaction to all that information in the news about wiretapping and the FBI doing this and everything, within a few years, the uh, wiretapping has become much more common. <laughs> People realize this is something they can do. And you tell something about the 55th, a story about the 55th Street wiretapping nest or some wiretap nest. Why don't you tell it? Because that, I was surprised how elaborate that was so early. So this is another great story that I've uncovered um, in mm -hmm. the process of writing this book, an astonishing story um, in which uh, in February of 1955, the New York Police Department and a couple of detectives who are employees of the New York Telephone Company acting on a kind of inside tip uncover a secret listening post located at 355 East 55th Street it's between First and York, if you want to go to the building mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in Manhattan. Uh, this listening post in the back bedroom of the fourth uh, floor uh, apartment uh, is connected to more than 100,000 of the Big Apple's uh, most high-profile telephones. And it turns mm -hmm. out for about um, a year and a half, this um, private wiretapping setup was um, doing all sorts of crazy things in the service of corporate espionage. Mm -hmm. uh, Pfizer, the company Pfizer was involved. Yes. They had paid um, uh, uh, the wiretap nest more than $60,000. It later came out in court uh, to spy on two rival pharmaceutical companies who were then litigating the rights to the antibiotic tetracycline. Well, I thought they also, were doing that to get the, the, the vaccine for the, vi for the COVID virus. <laughs> not, not quite yet. Not quite yet. Um, also, the wiretap nest was involved in a number of nasty kind of civil suits and divorce cases. Mm -hmm. And this is a really interesting case, uh, not just because it's kind of salacious uh, and really interesting, um, and a number of kind of high profile uh, uh, figures in the New York art world and kind of corporate America are involved in it, but also because it speaks to the pervasiveness of wiretapping in the private sector mm -hmm. in the early decades of the 20th century. Um, in many jurisdictions, uh, wiretapping law was non-existent. Mm -hmm. uh, New York, where the wiretap uh, nest was, um, was uh, uh, telephone tapping existed in a sort of interesting gray area. It was illegal for private citizens to tap telephones, but if you gave someone permission to tap your own line, that mm -hmm. was legal. It's called subscribers' right. rights wiretapping. Uh, this that set came out of, of a divorce case you, you mentioned. Yes, it also a divorce, a divorce case. case. If this, he wants to tap his own line, that's okay. <laughs> yes, if he wants to overhear his wife carrying on with another man, that's fine. There's an mm -hmm. interesting kind of gender politics to this, of course. Right. Um, needless to say, this kind of strange set of laws combined with uh, the telephone system reaching a real kind of saturation point in the 1950s um, gives rise to an entire kind of shadow industry of wiretapping and electronic surveillance for hire. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And one of the things I try to do in the book using the wiretap nest as a kind of a case study is to chart the history of this private industry, the, the wiretap trade, as it was called, mm-hmm. which is an industry that by some estimates reached, you know, uh, you know, almost a billion dollars. And it's, it's sort of um, uh, worth um, uh, by the late 1960s. Uh, and persisted well into the 1970s and 80s, even after private uh, the wiretapping, uh, wi- the tapping of lines on the part of private citizens, private investigators was made illegal under mm-hmm. federal law. Yeah, there are two real big issues that that you kind of kind of get raised in the 50s, according to the story about the the uh, wiretap mess that I thought was interesting. One is that the telephone companies were being persuaded to cooperate. Um, that, that just just like now, when people are complaining about, does, do the telephone companies help the police get all the information that they have on us? And does Google do that? All, all those kind of issues that are going on with our privacy issue. That was an issue in the 50s about the tele, uh, telecom companies and that pe- they did not want anyone to know that they were cooperating. That's one. Right. The other thing was the, the mess of, of um, state laws all having different uh, opinions about what to do about it versus the federal law. And that, that eventually is taken in. And on top of all that, you have what you talked about a little earlier. What was it? Section 610, was it? Or? 605. Section 605. 605 section 605. Act. With that word and in there and that interpretation was still going through the courts. So people didn't really have a, a, a good piece of information. And like it reminded me of the, of the uh, federal marijuana laws in California, it was legal, but federally it wasn't legal. Um, and, and you know, yeah. so what do you do about that? <laughs> How do you yeah. do about that? Yeah. It, it's Just, really a mess. Uh, yeah. It's really a mess up until the late 1960s. Um, there are contradictions, as you say, between federal law and state law. Um, and also, I think it's important to say that despite these contradictions and whatever the law said uh, on the books, um, there are two factions kind of emerging and we can see them, you know, we can kind of trace them all the way back to prohibition as we already did. There's a kind of anti wiretapping faction, a faction that we might associate with kind of civil liberties. And in fact, um, the ACLU was a, a kind of critical, um, uh, driver in this conversation from the 1930s onward, wiretapping as a violation of civil liberties and also of civil rights. Um, and there's a pro wiretapping faction, usually a kind of pro law enforcement, pro government faction. Um, you would think, based on the last 50, 60, 70 years of American history, that the pro wiretapping faction would always run the day. But one of the things that was so surprising in researching this book was just how mainstream what we now regard as a kind of marginal civil liberties, civil rights position was Mm -hmm. in American life. And I like to think that actually the ACLU among other entities was actually crucial in delaying the establishment of the government's wiretap authority. Um, It doesn't happen until 1968 that all of this chaos gets put to order. And I think it's critical to note just how important ordinary Americans were in pushing back against the intrusions of government and technology in the early decades of the 20th century, well into the 1960s. And there's a real shift in the late 60s as a result of uh, the rise of the the so-called law and order coalition. You, You make a really interesting point in your book about how close the history was to having a totally different outcome. Um, that is, you had Senator Long from Missouri and, and as I said, the ACLU, and even President Johnson seemed to be on, on that side of pushing for privacy and those issues. But that the fear, and that was like late 60s, but while well, well, Johnson was still president, 67, 68, but the fear caused by the race riots, you say, um, and, and you bring up the issue of race in the whole uh, point of law and order, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that that was crucial to passing this new law, which, which codified everything, made it legal, said when it could be, and said you had to go to a judge and get this. But all of those details were pretty routine as time went on. You know, the, 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 the attempt to constrain it. 
uh, legally was was you know just not that useful or not that important. It was just a ritual that was gone through. Um, I also find it very ironic that just a couple of years later, the Law and Order president, you know, Richard Nixon, was trapped by his own wiretapping of himself. <laughs> it's like, you know, it couldn't, it couldn't be more ironic if he had written it as a novel. Um, anyway, so why don't you, know, you want to? <laughs> there tell there that? are many ironies uh, yeah, to that yeah. story, among many uh, stories that I trace in the book. Yeah. Um, I think the story that. Uh, the listeners here may be less familiar with is the first story that you right. uh, gestured towards here that I trace in the book, which is the story of this uh, almost past right of privacy act mm -hmm. in the mid 1960s. This is the brainchild of a democratic Senator from Missouri named Edward Long, Edward V. Long. I had the uh, privilege of accessing his uh, personal papers, uh, his uh, official papers. I'm the first uh, kind of scholar to have been able to do so. Uh, mm. And his story is a very interesting one. Um, Long uh, is a pro-civil rights, pro-civil liberties Democrat and takes up the pet cause of privacy, electronic privacy in the early 1960s and holds a series of extremely high profile hearings that blow the lid off of wiretap and bug abuse in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, by 1966, 1967, he has formed a pretty solid coalition in Washington, a coalition that includes none other than Lyndon Johnson, the president himself, mm -hmm. surrounding this issue of privacy. And they draft this bill known as the Right of Privacy Act of 1967. And this is an act that would have, were it passed, uh, banned wiretapping for good on the mm -hmm. part of law enforcement, particularly in criminal investigations. The Right of Privacy Act notably left the question of national security unanswered, mm -hmm. but at least in terms of wiretapping for routine criminal investigations in the hands of police detectives in municipal jurisdictions, in uh, state jurisdictions around the country, uh, it would have wiped it out for good. Long ends up disappearing by the end of 1967. And mm -hmm. by 1968, the political atmosphere has shifted all the way to the other side in a kind of dramatic whiplash fashion. And the question is what happens? What, what happens between Long's Right of Privacy Act in 1967, early 1967, and the passage of Title III of the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968, which legalizes wiretapping for law enforcement under judicial oversight. But what happens in between those two signposts is the long, hot summer of 1967 mm -hmm. and the explosion uh, of the nation's streets into racial unrest. And by 1968, it was basically untenable for Long's position to exist. And uh, uh, it became critical uh, both for uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, in Congress to get behind a bill that empowered law enforcement in any way, shape or form. This is the, a product of a panic over crime, a panic over a kind of nation in chaos and also a panic over race. Uh, mm -hmm. So race is a really central part of this story. The last thing I'll say about this, just to kind of illustrate this last point, is the architect of the Federal Wiretap Act of 1968, uh, which is the, the kind of pet name of Title III of the Safe Streets Act. Mm -hmm. um, this is the act that legalizes wiretapping electronic surveillance for police under judicial oversight. Um, the architect of this law is uh, an Arkansas Democrat, uh, kind of law and order Democrat segregationist named John McClellan. And McClellan, in order to whip up support for this new piece of legislation of legalizing wiretapping, um, uh, is quoted on the floor of the Senate as saying, like, we need this to clean up our nation's streets, and we need this in particular to root out these Black radical organizations like the Black Panthers who are causing the chaos, the unrest, these riots in the first place. Um, how it is that a wiretap is going to stop a riot from happening mm 
No one really asked that question in the period. No. But McClellan's argument won the day. And his kind of dog whistle calls for wiretapping as a kind of routine crime control device mm -hmm. were critical in passing this law that was as late as like 18 months prior, totally mm -hmm. unthinkable. And we mm -hmm. still live in the world that John McClellan and the Law and Order Coalition of the 1960s made. Uh, the, the, uh, by far, uh, the, uh, numerically speaking, uh, the number of uh, telephones uh, uh, that are tapped in this country today are done under the aegis of this same 1968 law. It's changed mm -hmm. a couple mm -hmm. times. It's been amended over the years, but it's the same structure. It's the same uh, general idea. Um, and it, it is a real result of this shift uh, toward law and order, toward uh, empowering law enforcement. Um, and that's why I see, and this is a kind of central argument of the book, uh, that it's really the rise of law and order politics that helps to normalize and institutionalize the practice of wiretapping in America. And it really mm -hmm. took a century to get to that point. Yeah, I think you make an, another good connection too, because you, you talk about the race riots leading to that reaction against the whole privacy issue and in favor of law and order um, also led to Nixon's uh, election. Um, but in addition to that, that led to a whole attitude towards um, the racial issues that led to mass incarceration under Bill Clinton, that led to what we're dealing with today in reaction to this entire problem. Because, I mean, the, the, the whole buildup of mass incarceration is, is a problem we've talked about many times at the Commonwealth Club, because it's just sort of incredible that this is what we've done. And it's all, and, and the war on drugs, again, might just be not so much against drugs as it is against, you know, against this racial uh, issue that's been going on, or at least that's a, it does double duty in any case. Um, I, I think you, you made that connection very nicely. Yeah, his, historians don't often see the history of electronic surveillance having much to do with the history of the carceral state, and in particular, mm -hmm. the history of mass incarceration in the United States. But the connection between those two storylines is right there in the laws themselves. Mm -hmm. um, this law that I alluded to earlier, it's a really important law and it's a really important story in the second half of my book, is the Safe Streets Act of 1968, the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of mm -hmm. 1968. This is the critical law that permits the government to tap your telephone under judicial oversight. It just so happens that this is also the law that historians look to as the beginning of the beginnings of the mass incarceration problem. Uh, mm. Historians like Elizabeth Hinton uh, and many others uh, have looked to the Safe Streets Act as this critical moment that calcifies law and order as a mainstream political position in the United States and also gets the federal government into the business of crime control, which was up until that point really a matter of the states, on a scale that is unfathomable, even from the perspective of prohibition. Mm -hmm. um, so wiretapping and electronic surveillance are a really important part of this story. And the uh, far right uh, uh, kind of Southern Democrat segregationists um, uh, figures who were a part of the passage of this law, which uh, Johnson himself signed uh, um, in June of, of 1968, um, they saw empowering law enforcement to tap citizens' telephones and use electronic surveillance and use the fruits of electronic surveillance in a court of law as the critical piece of the legislation. Mm -hmm. We don't really see these two things have had, as having anything to do with each other today. But I think we really need to think about how they're intertwined. Um, I think that yeah. leads a different story. It does. And, and, you know, one of the things that I thought, this is a, a slight a tangential aside, but it's on the same point of how intertwined this was. You, you, you already mentioned Harold Lipset as, as one of the characters here um, as, as a wiretapper. The fact that he was an advisor to the Watergate committee at the Senate's Watergate Committee, at the same time that he was an advisor to Francis Ford Coppola's movie, The Conversation with Gene Hackett, which is just Hackman. I'm Hackman, sorry. yeah. Hackman, yeah. Uh, not Buddy Hackett. <laughs> uh, that 
but that at the same time, that's just kind of a fascinating glimpse of 1974 in our history, basically, you know, that they, he would do the same, that, that he had influence over both of these issues. Yes. And I think that speaks to an important through line in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't help but note, of course, that um, Francis Ford Coppola is the conversation 1974 is one of the great films of San Francisco. Right, right. <laughs> um, and Lipset himself, who was an advisor on the set of that film, was the great San Francisco private eye. Um, he's inseparable from the history of your city, I'm here in mm -hmm. D.C., um, uh, in the 60s uh, and in the 70s. Um, but this speaks to some other through lines, I think. The fact that wiretapping and electronic eavesdropping are kind of perennial points of fascination in American popular culture. Um, and this yields some kind of surprising connections. Lipset is one. There are a number of others that I trace in the book, the extent to which popular culture, popular artifacts uh, from uh, wire thriller dime novels of mm -hmm. uh, the late 19th century, early 20th century to David Simon's The Wire mm -hmm. um, of the early 21st century um, all revolve around wiretapping and a kind of public fascination with the doings of those who are listening in. Um, this is, I think, an important point to make because we like to think of wiretapping and electronic surveillance as things that are secret. They go on behind closed doors, but actually they're right out there in the open. And I wanted in the book to take seriously the kind of public knowledge that culture creates. And I think culture helps to drive this story as well. Well, we have one question that just came in uh, and it is about the conversation, the movie, the conversation. So I love the perfect. conversation. Happy to talk about it. But yeah. Um, I have two points we want to cover before we finish. So we'll, we'll, we'll move this, but the question is from David Grossoff and he says, what does Mr. Hoffman think of the movie, the conversation? Do you think the depiction of an ex FBI wiretapper, as a tormented Catholic is true to the demographics preferred by Hoover's FBI. So <laughs> I don't believe in the film that uh, Harry Call, Gene Hackman's uh, great character, is labeled as ex-FBI. Um, uh -huh. uh, but there are some other connections that I would note here, mm -hmm. um, just offhand. Uh, um, I, I should say, and I, I've already said this in case this didn't come through, that I love this film. It's like, a, <laughs> you know, one of my um, starting points. And in fact, to kind of get myself motivated to have this talk here today, I listened a little bit to the soundtrack. It kind of puts me I, in the I mood. think Gene Hackman said it's his favorite film, too. Oh, it's, it's such an amazing it's His, his favorite, that he, he was in, he said it was his favorite one. It's also a great art film as well. It's a kind of yeah. anomaly in Hollywood cinema for the 70s. Um, the Catholic angle is really interesting to me. Um, there is a strange kind of through line um, that only a kind of paranoid historian such as myself um, could detect of the relationship between electronic surveillance on one hand and American religious life on the other. This mm -hmm. is a history that stretches back to one of the earliest uh, wiretapping scandals in the country. Uh, 1916, this is a case in which uh, William Burns, the aforementioned William Burns, the great detective with a de detectaphone was involved, uh, in which the mayor of New York City had tapped the telephones of five Catholic, Catholic priests mm -hmm. uh, and runs all the way through uh, the 1950s with an amazing character who I trace in the book, uh, Jim Voss, J. Arthur Voss, who mm -hmm. was... Um, a uh, wiretapper for the mob. He worked for uh, the, the LA mobster, Mickey Cohen, um, and then uh, uh, had a kind of crisis of conscience and crisis of faith and was reborn at a Billy Graham tent revival. And Billy mm -hmm. Graham, uh, the uh, evangelical Billy Graham, made a, a best-selling kind of blockbuster movie about his life in 1955 called Wiretapper. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are many resonances between Graham's 1955 film, Wiretapper, and 1974, Coppola's conversation. Coppola himself was a devout Catholic, mm -hmm. uh, and also, you may be interested to know, um, tapped his own first telephone at the age of 12, as many 
of uh, those who were uh, um, uh, had a kind of facility with wiretapping electronic surveillance all did. Yeah, it's um, yeah, yeah, very fascinating. Uh, and for those who read the book, there's so many details about how this interacts with, with our pop culture in addition to everything else that's going on. And uh, I loved your talk about the wire and everything. Of course, we don't have time for all that. Uh, there's two things that I want uh, to finish up with is uh, one, the Brent Schoolcroft memo from 1992. And, and you're just reading the names of who he wrote it to. You know, at that time, the Secretary of Defense was Dick Cheney. Uh, the Attorney General was William Barr, the William Barr that just finished being Attorney General under Trump. Um, and the CIA Director, uh, Robert Gates, who was, was also the CIA Director for a long time. And he wrote this in 1992. What do we need to do to make things go the way we want? We have to force the telephone companies with their new technologies to give us access. You know, right now, they call it create a back door, right, to be able to get in. And that was a 1992 thing, which, which was their, that group's reaction to the fact that they were losing their ability to wiretap because the technology was changing off of lines to, to this electronic thing, and fiber optics doesn't allow it. So what? You can say a little bit about that, and then we'll talk about Martin Luther King. Sure. Um, so the law you're referring to, or, or the memo you're referring to, is a critical piece in a much broader story that the book traces. Uh, the lead up to um, a very important law that's passed in 1994, known as the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, um, or CALEA. CALEA is a law that um, basically required the telephone companies who were at that point recalcitrant uh, in uh, a newly competitive market. Uh, mm -hmm. It basically required them to make their infrastructures, their equipment, their new technology surveillance ready. It basically, to use your language, uh, required mm -hmm. the telephone companies to create a backdoor. Mm -hmm. um, this was the product of a long and dirty campaign that the FBI uh, put together in the 1990s. They called it Operation Root Canal, which was a kind of public campaign designed to convince the American public, convince Congress that the authorities in this new communications age after the breakup of the Bell system were playing the wiretap game from behind and essentially uh, had lost the ability to conduct electronic surveillance. We now know, historically speaking, that that wasn't exactly the case. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some really important cases that speak to this, and it is the case that the government did need help. But this is a landmark piece of legislation that's kind of now been forgotten in our post-2001 moment. And as you say, many of the players who later become important in mm -hmm. um, uh, the kind of post-2001 America um, mm -hmm. uh, were a, a, an important part of that story. I should say also um, that this act, this piece of legislation, CALEA, is part as well, not only of many of the you know, more uh, sort of right-wing figures that you uh, uh, alluded to here, mm -hmm. Scowcroft, Barr, and others, but also um, a critical piece of the Clinton crime control agenda. Mm -hmm. CALEA was passed just a couple of weeks after the notorious 1994 crime bill, and this was a critical component of the Democratic Party as well. So, mm -hmm. so wiretapping, as I found, uh, uh, has over time made very strange political bedfellows. And this is one of many instances that I've uncovered. Yeah. It, it's, it's amazing what would create bipartisanship <laughs> in our society. Um, but uh, the, the last piece, uh, we were in a little bit late, uh, is about Martin Luther King. As everyone uh, kind of knows that's read anything about it, he was tapped for uh, extensively for the last four or five, six years of his life. All those records are kept private, although there have been plenty of leaks and stuff like that. Um, and just I wanted you to talk a little bit about, you know, I, I like the way you wove that into the whole racial issue that this whole topic brings up. So why don't you say a little bit about that? So it's, it's, it's supposed to open up in 2027, right? <laughs> yes, um, the King wiretaps are going to be unsealed in 2027. So the book kind of ends in 2027, even oh. though we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> when I was writing this book, I, I didn't quite know where to fit King in. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Just like I didn't quite know where to fit Nixon in either. These are stories about wiretapping that most Americans know. They're the first stories we think of, in fact. Mm -hmm. The FBI's harassment and surveillance of Martin Luther King. And of course, as you alluded to earlier, um, Nixon's um, uh, bugging of himself along with it to himself, uh, yes. 18 <laughs> members of his National Security Council and journalists oh. uh, uh, alongside many others. Um, and I became very interested not only in the FBI's surveillance of King, uh, abhorrent as it is, but also in the attempts on the part of several generations of historians to get access to those files. Mm-hmm. And I think that the history or the afterlife, call it, of the King wiretaps, of course, they stop in 1968 when King is assassinated. Um, the afterlife provide a fascinating kind of coda to the story that the book tells. Um, it was widely known as early as 1969 that King was under extensive electronic surveillance. And uh, politicians, academics, journalists try to get at those files very quickly. They're placed under seal uh, in the wake of the church committee investigations uh, in the mid 1970s. And they surface throughout the 80s and 90s in a variety of interesting ways. I think the most interesting way for me is that a number of enterprising historians um, King's best biographers, David Garrow on one hand, Taylor Branch on the other, all found creative ways to access the contents of the FBI's wiretaps of Martin Luther Mm -hmm. King. And I was really interested in why this was and why it was that we think of wiretaps both as a kind of privileged form of evidence in criminal proceedings but also a privileged form of evidence in the writing of history. Mm -hmm. Uh, Historians like me love FBI files. Uh, Mm -hmm. We love electronic records. Um, But what are the ethics of our attempt to access them? And Mm -hmm. what does it say that the same year, or almost the same year that Jesse Holmes, the notorious segregationist senator, is holding up Uh, King's redacted wiretap transcripts in front of Congress in order to prevent, uh, this is 1983, Martin Luther King Day from becoming law. And at Mm -hmm. the same time, one of King's great biographers, uh, David Garrow, is using those same wiretaps, uh, wiretap transcripts, to write one of King's uh, most authoritative biographies. Mm -hmm. Of course, Garrow has very different aims in mind, uh, far more noble, of course, um, Mm -hmm. than does... um, Helms. Uh, And I'm not here to cast aspersions on two of the kind of luminaries of the American historical field, Garrow Mm -hmm. and Branch. But I do think that they are representative of a kind of authority that we ascribe to electronic surveillance records. Mm -hmm. And I thought that it was a neat way to kind of trace that history at the end of the book uh, Mm -hmm. into the present and also, as we say, into the future, since they'll be unsealed in 2027. And who knows what's going to happen when that happens. When that happens. Well, that's a great place to end. There's lots more details in the book, The Listeners by Brian Hoffman. Thank you very much for uh, talking to us about all the history that you uncovered. And so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 120th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. Hope to see you again. Thanks so much.